Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. Today in our continuing segment on History 102 in the 20th century, we're due conservatism in the 1920s. How are you going to keep them down on the farm when they've seen Paris? Answer, you can't. Not without Hallmark Christmas movies. So what's the most surprising thing about conservatism in the 1920s? And the answer is that it stayed in power in the United States and Western Europe. Really, except for Germany, and we'll talk about that as why it's an exception, um, and obviously the Soviet Union, mostly conservative power stayed in power from the First World War into the Second World War. And you would think, well, wait a minute, Professor, you just talked about how everything changed, that World War I changed everything. And that's exactly true. And that's how you get liberalism in the cities. But for most people, for a lot of people, for these, for France, for Britain, for the United States, World War I and the ensuing pandemic was a trauma. And so there was this go back to the way things were. Remember, when we started, Mr. Banks is having a great life. No? Yeah, there's there's feminism and there's you know the kids wanting to like have a relationship but for the most part he had a job he had money he had a nice house he had a happy family so why can't we go back to the way things were the french wanted revenge versus germany and an empire in the middle east they want to spread their man, their empire into the ottoman empire into what had been the Ottoman Empire. The British want reparations from Germany for all the money they spent, for all the loans they had to take out from the United States. And they also want to expand their empire. Pretty conservative things, right? Revenge, money, that's, that, that's basically the traditions of peace treaties. More empire, very, very conservative. Americans increasingly wanted not to be involved with European craziness anymore. We had been sucked in, the United States had been sucked in to the war for a whole variety of reasons. And plenty of people said, you know what, that was enough. That was plenty. We don't want to be the policemen of Europe. We don't want to keep these people from killing each other. There's too much craziness going on. Let's just go back to America and make money. Only Germany, the Weimar Republic, became a major liberal power. And that's because... They had to overthrow the emperor to end the war. At the end of the war in 1919, there's a brief civil war, a uh, brief revolution. The emperor abdicates and moves, I think, to the Netherlands. Um, and so they put in a republic. They changed the entire government in order to have the armistice, in order to have the peace treaty of Versailles, in order to end the war. You have a liberal government. In, in Germany called the Weimar Republic. So conservatism in the USA in the 1920s was an alliance between big business who wanted less taxes and regulations from before the war. Notice during the war, taxes go up. Taxes always, 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 or at least until the Vietnam War, go up. They're supposed to go up. That's how you pay for war. War is the most expensive things humans have figured out how to do. And so big business wanted to keep all the profits they made from the war. But now, you know, not pay so much taxes or regulations. That they had to because it was necessary to keep um, industrial peace. You couldn't have any strikes. So workers had to get paid better, right? You had to have less racism so African-Americans and Hispanics could get jobs. Uh, women were working. Uh, you know, so there was this, there, there were higher taxes because these businesses were making a lot of money off the British, the French, and the American governments. And so that money was just being poured back in to the society. So big business wanted to go back to like, you know, 1910 or, you know, if it could, 1890. So you have the alliance of big business 
and this group that you wouldn't think would ally with them, which is rural social Christian conservatives. Rural folk who, in their Christianity, had a conservatism not of economics so much, but of society. They wanted to control the cities. They wanted women to be mothers again, not flappers. They wanted men to be men again, not workers or homosexuals or, or jazz musicians or whatever the heck was going on in those cities. That should look familiar to you because that's essentially the Republican Party of today. If you look at the elections of President Trump, um, Mitt Romney, uh, and President George W. Bush, especially 2004, you'll see um, at the county level, rural counties overwhelmingly go for Republicans. But the cities overwhelmingly go for the Democrats. And what has happened is the Republicans have become the party of conservatives, social conservatives, and the Democrats have become the party of social liberals. And that wasn't always the case. In fact, the Democrats were, until the 1930s, the party of conservatism. And it's not until the 60s that it becomes socially liberal. So, and the Republicans become socially conservative really in, as a party um, in the 70s following Nixon's elections, which called the Southern Strategy, what's called um, with the alliance, especially with Reagan, with the um, Christian coalition, the Christian right parties. And the result of this is three Republican conservative presidents from Harding, who had an immensely corrupt uh, administration and Whew, sex capades, the stuff, the, the porn, pornographic love letters he wrote to his mistresses. Whew, he had at least one baby out of wedlock while president. Um, he did things in White House closets during working hours that, like, I cannot repeat. Um, yeah, yeah, hard. I mean, he wasn't the only one who ever did these kind of things, but woo, -hoo. sexcapades, uh, or Hoover. And I have pictures of the two of them from. And I just thought they were kind of, you know, Harding kind of looks like Harding with a bit of a, you know, longer hair weave. But I mean, Hoover looks badass. Hoover looks like a WWE wrestler. Um, and they these. Pictures come from a um, Twitter thread called If Presidents Had Mullets and Were Cool uh, by at Cam Harless. And the Hoover one is just, ex the Hoover one is excellent. I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, the Barack Obama one, just if, you, if you're interested, um, Joe Biden's awesome. He's just, with a mullet, Joe Biden just looks great. Um, Donald Trump is... Not as good of a picture, but it's very Roadhouse. It's very Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. So it's very familiar. Um, so, and Barack Obama looks like B Billy D. Williams mixed with Bruno Mars. Like, I looked at it and went, oh my God, that's Billy D. Williams circa like 1973. And when I went to post that on Twitter, um, I saw the other comments from younger, from Gen Z people were like, it's Bruno Mars. And I'm like, yeah, it is. It's a it's a mix of the two. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. But we have three Republican conservative presidents in a row from 1920 to 1932, 12 years of conservative Republican presidents. Wages were high. Jobs were plentiful. Consumer goods were cheap. Why would anyone want to mess with that? And so the Republican Party won. So what did American conservatism promise to win to, to the 1920s? What did it promise? If the cities were promising um, fun and money and excitement and you could do what you've always wanted to do, kind of like, you know, the way Vegas 
uh, advertises itself. You know, be who you want to be in New York. What was American conservatism promising? And this is best stated in Warren Harding's Return to Normalcy speech. And here's a picture of actual Warren Harding um, where he says, America's present, America's present need is not heroics, but healing. Not nostrums, but normalcy. Not revolution, but restoration. Now, remember, the end of World War I was chaotic. There were, 1919 had the most labor strikes, the most uh, racial violence uh, that the country had seen in a long time. And so there was the, the communist revolution in Russia, the... Eastern European countries, uh, they weren't even countries, they were empires, had collapsed. The Ottoman Empire had collapsed, the Austrian Empire had collapsed, Germany, the German Empire had collapsed, and all these new countries were being made. There was chaos. There was the pandemic, there was the flu that, remember, killed 20 million people around the world. Um, so there was chaos in the world in 1919. And 1919 is one of the worst years to have ever lived through. So it ranks up there with, with, with 2018, with 1968, um, 1848, you know, and really all of the 14th century because of the Black Plague. So when Harding is talking, you have to just re keep that in mind. He's talking about all of this chaos that has happened in the last year. So not revolution, but restoration. Not agitation, but adjustment. Not surgery, but serenity. Not, dr not the dramatic, but the dispassionate. Not experiment, but equipoise. Not submergence in internationality, but sustainment in triumphant nationality. Mm. What were they promising? They were promising to make America 1886 again, to get rid of the World War I changes, to get rid of the progressivism changes. So what they were promising was not so much conservative as revanchist, a revanchist conservatism, especially for businesses versus unions. Striking workers and unions had gone from being shot in the 1880s to having a seat at the table with the government helping negotiate contracts. Because during the war, the, the United States government needed things to be made. It needed guns, it needed uniforms, it needed bullets, it needed tanks, it needed things to be made. So you couldn't have a strike. So unions gained power. So there's this revanchism that's very conservative. That's, that's more conservative than normal traditional conservatism. So we've gone from a traditional conservatism of, you know, kind of the pre-Teddy Roosevelt, because Teddy is kind of a... He's, while he's a Republican, he's kind of center lefty. I mean, he's a conservative, but he's a liberal conservative. He's, he's okay with changes. You know, he's not changing the entire society, but he's, he's a reformist. But now we're like, all of those reforms sucked. We have to go back. There's anti-communism. And there's an active attempt to undermine the Soviet Union. Whether it's the invasion of the Soviet Union with... Uh, the UK and France and Japan, I think Japan does too in the, in the East, um, trying to help the uh, Mensheviks, the, the kind of republic, pro-Republican, pro-Western group, or at least the more conservative group in Russia. I mean, the Bolsheviks, the, the Lenin's group is going to win. But there was an attempt, there was actually an invasion of, of, of Russia to try to stop it from becoming the Soviet Union. And there's an anti-feminism. You know, make women mothers again. There's a the invention of Mother's Day. There's also the anti-college 
anti-birth control, anti-social welfare of the 1920s. Here's an article. Women anarchists have become the terror of the world's police. Their daring crimes are said to have outstripped the deeds of the brothers in red. Women have lost all sense of fear. Emotional women have lost all sense of fear. The guardians of the world nearly always find a woman implicated when a ruler is stricken down. Right? Is Women can't be political. Women can't be feminists. Feminism is bad. We have to make women mothers again. And there's a bit of eugenics in this, too. There's a bit of the racism and the eugenics in this of trying to emphasize motherhood. And it's the motherhood of white women. It's the, if we don't ha I don't have a graph of it, um, but we'll talk about this in part three because we'll talk about it in modernity. But already the, the birth rate for, for, quote, American white women, so non-immigrants, non-Italians, non-Greeks, non-Jews, non-recent immigrants for what, what, you know, so we're talking the, the Irish and the British and the Germans and the Swedes and the Norwegians. Those groups were, was already either at replacement or below replacement levels, which is about 2.1 children per woman. And the reason why it's a 0 .1, 0 0.2 is because not all children, one, live to adulthood, and two, not all children will be married and have children will have children, so you need two. And the reason why you need two is because a man can't give birth. So you, so when he dies, that's one less person, you know? So you, you have to replace the man as well as the woman. So you need, a woman has to have two children, a little more than two children on average, in order for the population to go up. And demographers were already having heart attacks, heart palpitations that the white Americans were going to disappear. They were going to be overwhelmed by these brown Europeans who weren't white, the Italians, the Greeks, the Jews. Um, and there's going to be um, no white people left. No white people would just disappear because women were going to college. Women were using birth, white women were using birth control, and white women were, were didn't have to, need, they didn't need a man because of all this social welfare. This is emphasized in a song from the time called How Are You Going to Keep Them Down on the Farm After They've Seen Paris? Paris. And it's a conversation between what is essentially a middle-aged, you know, in their 40s, maybe early 50s, uh, parents. Rural farmer parents. And it goes, Reuben, Reuben, I've been thinking, said his wifey dear. Now that all is peaceful and calm, the war is over. The boys will soon be back on the farm. So this is done after the armistice. This, this conversation is taking place after the armistice. November 11th, right? 11, 11, 1919. But before... The boys have shipped out of France and come home. Before their sons have returned. And boys means both their sons, but the boys of the neighborhood, American boys, right? The boys will soon be back on the farm. Mr. Reuben started winking and slowly rubbed his chin. He pulled his chair up close to mother. Now look, look, look at how just... The characters are addressed, right? Wifey is a diminutive. You know, Mr. Reuben, right? So he's given a title of the husband, Mr. of a man, right? Pulled up close to mother. Notice she has gone from a wife to now she's mother. And asked her with a grin, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? How are you going to keep them away from Broadway, jazzing around, up oh, there's jazz, and painting the town, meaning getting drunk and having a good time? How are you going to keep them away from harm? That's a mystery. They'll never want to see a rake or a plow, right? This hard work of the farm after they've seen, had all this fun. And who the deuce can parley vu a cow? Like, how do you talk to a cow? How can you talk to a cow? I mean, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? 
And the idea is very simple. It's how are you going to keep them on the boring farm to do the hard work of farming when they've seen the city, when they've seen the larger, liberal, more exciting world? How are you going to keep them away from harm, from drinking, from having sex with loose women, with naughty women, from getting maybe an STD? Naughty, naughty. Or being seduced by, you know, God forbid, a man. You know, this liberal, more exciting world is an existential threat to rural life and culture. Because it's not exciting. It's just not, it can't compete. Distance used to equal protection. It used to equal, well, what else are you going to do? You're, you're rural in a small town. You're going to grow up. You're going to inherit the farm. You're going to build a nice business, either as a farmer or a um, worker, a laborer in town. Maybe, you know, build a, you know, become a carpenter or, you know, a plumber. Or, you know, you'll, you'll have some kind of um, respectable, you'll have respect and dignity dignity you'll be a man of the town right but now you have rail now you have railroads you have cars and all these towns are connected because they have to be connected in order to sell their agricultural goods so you have to be connected either by rail or by road so the boys can just get on a rail and buy a ticket and be in chicago in a day where they can buy a car with the money they made from being in the war and just drive away. Cities were more exciting, but they're also dangerous and more sinful. And the existential threat is the cities will gobble up people. They will take all the youth. And I heard this. I heard this over and over and over again during the 2016 election. That New York Times writers, Washington Post writers, the Atlantic correspondents for Atlantic Magazine, you know, liberal writers will go out to like central Pennsylvania or, or southwestern Iowa and they'd be like, what's the biggest problem you see right now? And people would over and over and over again say, all the kids are leaving. They're all going to college. And then once they get a job, once they get a degree in college, they don't come back here. They don't come back to be a farmer. They go to Chicago. They go to L.A. They go to San Francisco, Seattle, New York. Why? Because it's way better. It just is. It has always been. The city has always been better, more exciting. You make more money. You have more adventures. Always. That's the problem, right? That's the Hebrews talking about Babylon, right? And the Tower of Babel is like, yeah, they could do great things, but it's also dangerous. It's sinful. It's too much. It's too much of everything. And that's what they're saying here. The father's like, what are you going to do? They've seen Paris. They're not going to stay here in Kansas. They're just not. It was better when they didn't know how exciting Paris was. Now they know. And they've had a good time. So... You can't. You can't. They are going to leave. So what's the solution for conservatives with business in the 1920s? So if that's one of their constituency, big business, what's their solution? And their solution is free trade economics. Less taxes, less regulation on global trade, and especially the movement of money. And that's going to be a problem come the 1930s. But the idea that money, credit, can move... It doesn't have to stay in the United States. You can invest in the London stock market, in the Frankfurt stock market, in the German stock market, in Frankfurt. You can buy British companies, French companies, farms in Switzerland. That money, not people, but money, should be able to go anywhere without any restrictions. Was not completely new. But now it was like supercharged in the end of the First World War. 
and Harding and Coolidge and Hoover were all for it. They were conservative, free trade, economic presidents. They were all for it. They were pro-big business. This is what big business wanted. It would help them get bigger. It would help them make more profits, employ more people. Hey, great. The second was opposition to unions, that the government would go from being at least supportive of the existence of unions in order for peace to antagonism, to attacking them, to seeing them as too socialist. So many of these unions have Jews in them or are run by Jews or people of European descent with weird Eastern European ideas, i.e. Marxism. So one is that the unions were just too socialist. Everyone was working together. They called themselves brothers. It was a brotherhood of electricians. That's not very capitalist, where you're an individual. The other thing was that the opposition to unions was that it limited the freedom of the individual to negotiate. That the idea was the union stepped in and oppressed the individual. It set itself up. See, you... Pete, see, you're, you're special. You. And I'm talking just to you. You're special. So you, if you went into your boss's office and you said, I want a 20% raise, you would get it. Totally get it. Because you are awesome. But see, if you're in a union, the union has to care about everybody, even that loser who doesn't come in on time and who always has a reason why he's late for work and always never really gets done what he's supposed to do and other people have to pick it up. Yeah, that guy, that guy, oh, that guy, right? He's going to get the same raise as you. Instead of it being 20% because you're special, it's going to be 4%. So everybody has to be limited to the least common denominator. That guy. That's the conservative argument against unions. It's still, it is still the conservative argument against unions. That's what Amazon will tell its people. Do, do you really want to have a union where you can't negotiate? You know, you're special. You could make more money. You just have to come into your manager and ask. Uh, yeah, no, that ain't happening. I'm going to tell you that's not happening because Amazon is a trillion dollar company and they don't care. So, but that's the argument. And what does this all lead to? An idea for economics of the rugged individualism. The, the man, and it is a masculine idea. Now, women can do this too, but it is clearly a masculine idea. So like, I have my Marlboro man, the Marlboro man. He doesn't need a woman. He doesn't need anything. It's him and his horse and his smokes. He is. He doesn't need government for a bailout or support or welfare. He just needs the mountains and his smokes. And the idea is a self-reliant individual who doesn't rely on government help and through hard work, sobriety, prudence, he is a success and he has saved up. He doesn't have debts. He doesn't have credit card debts. No, there are no credit cards, but the idea is he doesn't have debts. He doesn't owe anybody anything. Now, remember those big businesses? They owe a lot of people a lot of stuff because just businesses always run debts. They, even when they're making profits, they always have debts because they're always borrowing money to pay money because the money comes in differently than they think. So, you know, even if you're a rich company, you got a lot of debt. You borrow a lot of money from the banks. But, but these real rugged individuals, they don't owe anybody anything. And if you lose a job, you just go on and get another job. Take a look at our Marlboro man. Who wouldn't hire him? He could be a cowboy. He could be a host at California Pizza Kitchen. I mean, who wouldn't want to walk in and get seated by him, right? I mean, he could be a male model in the magazines. That's how handsome he is. Now, let's face it, he's never losing his job because he's so awesome. He's the Marlboro Man. 
So the rugged individual doesn't need anything. College or unions or government aid. All he needs is his own abilities. He doesn't need to ask for help. He doesn't need to ask for assistance. He doesn't need any of that because through his own hard work and his own wonderfully masculine Christian behavior, he's definitely, definitely not gay. He's definitely not a homosexual. He loves having sex with women, but only the right woman at the right time. Otherwise, it's him and his horse, the real love of his life, because he's a rugged man. And you don't need to go to the fancy elite colleges and learn things like Plato and French things like Rousseau and Robespierre and other things that start with a rolling R. No. And you certainly don't need unions to limit your awesome ability. Is there any union on a ranch? No. The cowboys all get paid individually, and they all go, and they get paid what they are, are meant to get paid because they are rugged individuals. And government? You ain't seen any government around there. Only The only government guys who show up are the regulators who mess things up because they have their little, their little uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets in back in the big city, and they've never even been to a farm. They've never been to a ranch. They don't know how things really work in the real world. And if that sounds familiar to you, you know where it comes from. You know that's a part of this class is none of this is new. It all goes back at least to the 20s, if not earlier. And it's the same language. So solutions for the cons for conservatism with racial and social conservatives. Okay, big business wants to be let free, right? It wants to do its own thing. That's different for racial and social conservatives. Racial and social conservatives want government to do things. And what they want government to do is regulate people. You see this today. You, you see this right now going on in Florida. The current governor of Florida came to fame, launched his kind of career by not having the mask mandates, by saying businesses can open, Disney World can open again, and nobody has to monitor how much COVID is spread. You just can open up and do what you want. No masks, no nothing. You know, and if Disney World can do it, all the other places can do it. Fort Lauderdale beaches can do it, and... And, um, and Universal theme parks can do it, and Gator World can do it. Yeah, even the Gators don't have to wear masks anymore. So economically, there was less regulation. But then they also signed bills that said, you can't teach certain things in school. Can't have the AP African American history class. You have to sh take the books down from your library that may be objectionable to anybody who might find it objectionable. What might they find objectionable? It's not really said in the law. It's just objectionable. So for social conservatives, it's using government to attack liberals. Thus, liberals attack, you know criticized the law that was passed as called the don't say gay bill. Like you have the freedom to teach what you want as long as you don't teach about gay people and forget about trans people. They are not supposed to even exist. There are new rules. Tennessee just had a law that was passed that outlawed um, drag shows in the city because, you know, drag queens are destroying America. Clearly. And so that idea that business should be able to do whatever the F it wants without much regulation or taxation, but government should be used to basically attack outside groups, liberal groups, uh, minority groups who want change, that's right out of the 1920s. So there's non-opposition to the Ku Klux Klan, and the Ku Klux Klan goes from being a terrorist organization to being 
able to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the Capitol to 5 million members in the 1920s. Now, here's the thing. The biggest Ku Klux Klan organization was not in the South. It wasn't in Alabama. It wasn't in Mississippi. It wasn't in Georgia. It was in Indiana. How many black folk were in Indiana? Not as many as in Mississippi or Alabama. So you could see that as black folk moved north, so did racism and fear and racial terrorism in the Klan. Now, the racism was already there, but now the fear comes in. It was one thing when there was like one black family in town. Now there's four or five. And craziness is happening. They're taking over. Because when I was a kid, there were none. And now, there, then there was one. And now, you know, so, you know, you get the old timers who talk about the Bronx as being Italians and Jews. You know, oh, I remember when, when everyone in the Bronx was Italians. Well, it's Sp black and Spanish. And it has been since, like, at least the 70s. But they go, oh, it changed. It, and they always have that refrain. They always have that refrain with a little head shake of, like, and then it started to change. But what? How? How did it change? How did it change? How it changed was the white folk moved to Long Island and black and Spanish folk moved in. And then more white people moved out to move to live with more white people out in the suburbs. So the Klan moved along out of the South. It left the South and moved with the Great Migration. It came with it. And so did racial terror terrorism. And it found fertile ground in rural northern states where it was like, you used to have no black people around. You used to have no minorities. And now there's Italians, Jews, and blacks moving in. How do you feel about that? And they'd say, uh, not so comfortable about that. I mean, I'm sure they're fine people and they should be able to live wherever they want. Just do they have to be my neighbor? And so you get terrorism of black folk, which is what the Ku Klux Klan was built on. But now that it's left the South, it also goes after immigrants, Catholics, and Jews. These new Northern groups that are moving, that are moving in. So it becomes a, not just a Ku Klux Klan as a, quote, white group, but of a nationalist, old American, old white group of what white people used to be. So Irish Catholics who have been here long enough, right? British, people of British descent, Germans. Maybe some Norwegians or Swedes, but, you know, that's far out in Minnesota and such. But some of them, too, like the old, quote, American stock, end quote. The kind of people who, when asked what your ethnicity is, they say American. Those people. That's what they want the country to return to. So they want to get rid of these brown immigrants from Italy and Spain and Greece. They want to get rid of the Jews. Because they're not Christian. I mean, at least the, the Italians are Catholic. The Jews, on the other hand. What is that? So the Ku Klux Klan actually expands as it goes into the northern states and expands who it hates. And who it hates, it takes on the racial animus of the north. So you get public marches to show strength and to show official support. See, if the government didn't support the Ku Klux Klan, could the Ku Klux Klan march down Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol to the White House? Could it? Then there's the end of the immigrate. There's the 1924 end of immigration laws. In 1924, essentially, they passed a law that limited immigration to um, who used to be the immigrants, Irish, British, Germans, and tried to lock out Italians, Jews, Greeks, Spaniards. 
Portuguese. The idea was to keep America American. Now, that American had, needs quotation marks around it, and I, I don't put them there, but the, there you should just think that they are, because who got defined as American was a complicated idea. There's the Red Summer in 1919 against communism. All those liberal ideas of you know free of uh, of liberty and uh, brotherhood and comradeship and that women are equal to men and that maybe we should have better uh, more equality in the in the distribution of profits. You get the Red Summer, 1919. You get Tulsa, the destruction of uh, black wealth in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1921. So you have mass violence against minorities. Because the Red Summer went after Jews, went after Europeans, went after new immigrants who had come in fleeing the First World War. And being Europeans, they came in with more socialist ideas. And then finally, and this is kind of the weirdest one, but it gets snuck in there, and it's probably the longest lasting one. The 1924 immigration law is going to go until like 1964, and then it's going to be changed and immigration is going to be completely different after 1964. The public marches end in the 1920s. Uh, Catholics and Jews become essentially white people. And the Red Summer and Tulsa are essentially forgotten. Like, the Tulsa destruction was essentially forgotten by white people until the TV show, The Watchmen, brought it up again. And then all of a sudden, in my, my news magazines, all of a sudden, it's like, what really happened? The Tulsa, the, the riot that, the white riot that uh, time forgot. And, like, you know. So it was this, this, this Tulsa was forgotten to such a point that people didn't think it was real. They're like, oh, white people did not attack these black people. That never happened. You're making that up. It's liberals making that up. So, but the kind of strangest, but the longest lasting one is the Southern Lost Cause. The Southern Lost Cause went mainstream, went northern. It goes so mainstream that me, the son of Italian, Irish, German, Hungarians, living in New York, in the suburbs of New York, in my elementary school, learned Southern lost cause propaganda. That the war, the Civil War, was about states' rights, not slavery. That carpetbaggers from the North came South and oppressed the Southerners. That all the Southerners wanted to do was live their lives, and they actually treated their slaves fairly well, gave them educations and Christianity, and really, the Civil War was a giant misunderstanding that Northerners and Abraham Lincoln like, took way too seriously. I learned that. Which is insane. New Yorkers, Irish New Yorkers, helped destroy the South. Irish immigrants became citizens to help destroy the South. They came in, they were given a gun, they signed, hi, now you're American, here's your gun, go shoot up the Southerners. My Irish family was already here. They had been here since around the revolution or before the revolution. Marched down south, burned down southern cities. And yet I was learning the propaganda of southern slaveholders and how they were the real victims of the Civil War. Like that's, and that's in the 80s. That's crazy. And you still get it today. You still get the fights today. You see it on Twitter all the time. You see it on Reddit all the time. It's still there. So, but that becomes, the Southern Law, of course, goes mainstream in the 20s. It leaves the South. So that me, in my suburban school in New York in the 80s, learned it. What about religious conservatives? All right, we have the social conservatives. That's the Ku Klux Klan and the end of immigration. And But what about the religious conservatives? The people who want, you know, to make America godly again, right? you know, who want to get rid of the atheists and the Jews, and they're not really comfortable with the Catholics. 
right? You know, the Catholics like Jesus, but, you know, they got that thing from Mary, and they have all those sacraments that are weird, and they got that book in Latin that nobody can read. What's in there? Like, they say it's the Bible, but are you sure it's the Bible? And their, their, their priests, their ministers, all wear dresses and don't get married. That's weird. So what about these religious conservatives in the 1920s? Well, these are rural Protestant Christian conservatives, and it includes white and black folk. Black Christian conservatism is very traditional. The black church is, is in some ways very, very liberal, especially on ideas of freedom and equality, the brotherhood of men. But in like personal behavior, it's got a lot of Old Testament there too. It's got a lot of like sin and fire and brimstone. You know. And what they're going to get is the prohibition of alcohol. Prohibition. That alcohol is the great evil. And the prohibition of alcohol is not made a law. It's made a constitutional amendment. The first constitutional amendment that restricts rather than gives rights. That says thou shalt, thou shalt not rather than thou can, thou will. And there's going to be huge opposition to birth control. And the opposition to birth control is that it's playing God. You are playing God. God wanted you to have a white baby, and you, you hussy, are doing the sexy, sexy stuff without, without paying the punishment of having to raise a baby. You are having fun without the responsibility. In fact, a birth control for, for Christian conservatives is uh, birth control meant marriage was over. Why? What? Like, if women can have sex without having getting pregnant, without the fear of getting pregnant, then why get married? There's no point in the marriage. Pfft. Why would men and women get married? Men could just have keep having sex with women whenever they want. Why, as my as my dear mother has said, why buy the cow? if you could get the milk for free. Like, I have heard that from many a boomer mom talking about, you know, girl, female behavior post-1960s. Why buy the cow if you could get the milk for free? Now, you may go, there's a lot of problems with that statement, but it's the idea that why would you get married? Companionship, partnership, com conversation, a like-minded ideal? Come on. Really? Men and women? Please. What do they have to talk about? They're not partners. Down in 1925, they're not. They have nothing in common. My great-grandparents, one spoke Hungarian, one spoke German. Now, if you know anything about those two languages, you know they are nothing alike. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And they were married for God knows how long, and they had 14 children, and he never learned German, and she never learned Hungarian, and so they had nothing to talk about, and yet still had 14 babies. So... What did they have in marriage? What was their marriage like? Their marriage was, he went to work, he made the money, he came home, he gave her the money. She took the money, she bought the food, she bought the clothes for the kids, they bought the school supplies, and he went back to work. And he hung out with his, his male friends, his work friends, his Hungarian-speaking friends, and she had what, she had her daughters, and maybe a few cousins, if they had come over from from Germany. From Austria-Hungary. You know, a few family members. That's it. That was their marriage. P companions. So eugenicists worried that there weren't enough white babies. So you had to have birth control. So... And there is a problem of racism, right? There's a problem of, of race, having an 
you couldn't have explicitly racist laws. I mean, I mean, I know Jim Crow segregation is explicitly racist, right? But you couldn't be like, black women have to be on birth control, but white women can't have birth control. Like, even that was too far, like, for anybody. And the birth control wasn't yet the pill. It wasn't yet 95 plus percent effective. So, you know, it's, it's an intermediary. It's a start. It's a, it's a bit of control, but it's not perfectly worry-free. And you couldn't just force black women or Hispanic women to be on birth control. You could, and they did, eugenicists did, um, sterilize Native American women. If you've seen Yellowstone, you have an idea of how this worked. Um, they have that. They have the a clinic that is a birth, a gyne uh, gynecological clinic that is both, it serves several purposes, for, um, one of which is abortions, but it's also sterilization of Native American women. They will do that to various different kinds of women. Um, but yeah, but opposition to birth control plays a bit into religion and a bit into racism of not having a, a, a woman be a wife and mother, and then the eugenicist, which is we're being overwhelmed by non-white people. Now remember, the non-white people are still Europeans. They are Italian, Spanish, German, uh, Greeks, excuse me, Eastern Europeans, Poles, Russian Jews, right? That's who they feel aren't white. So all of this was a way for a rural America to control urban America instead of being left behind. It was putting shackles on, on urban America. Remember Reuben, Reuben? How are we going to keep them safe? Well, we're going to make, we're going to make rules. We're, we're going to make laws that make urban America not that much fun. We're going to get rid of the alcohol. Ha ha! Can't paint the town if you're not drunk, right? Ha ha! We're going to do things that control youth behavior. See Footloose. Footloose. Right? Nobody can dance in town. This is the 1980s. And it's a religiously conservative place. John Lithgow is a is the leading pastor, preacher in town. He's a minister. He's a Protestant minister. His daughter is rebellious. So she's rebellious, of course, by doing the sexy, sexy stuff. Um... But the big thing is dancing. That youth, that one time there was a party and a bunch of kids got into a car accident and died. And so the parents were so traumatized that they said, oh, you know what, if they hadn't been dancing, they wouldn't have been having the fun that got them killed. So we'll just not have dancing. No drinking, no dancing, done. That's Footloose. And then guess how it ends? An immigrant, a guy from outside the town, comes in from the big city with his liberal ideas, and in the end, the town is dancing. And look at all these girls who are having a very good time and can't wait for the party to end. Which is exactly what the conservative rural folk were afraid of. The ending of Footloose, the last 10 minutes of Footloose, is actually a nightmare for religious conservatives. It's also a way to attack Catholics and new immigrants. This prohibition of alcohol, right? The Italians and the Greeks drink wine. Drink wine in Catholicism, drink wine in Orthodoxy, in their religious ceremony, but drink wine anyway. I'm Italian, man. You, you have wine. There's wine. There's always wine. Red wine, red wine, it's mostly red wine, but red wine. You know, there's, there's always a table red, a Chianti, there's always something. You know. You have your pasta, your meat, and you have your wine. So, you know, it's Irish cream for a reason. 
right? It's Irish coffee for a reason. So it's a way of attacking Catholics who drink alcohol, but especially the new immigrants, the Italians and the Greeks, because it's a way of controlling them, of making them like us, of making them Protestant in a lot of ways. What about conservatism in Europe? Well, it's different. In Germany and Eastern Europe, it's pretty much a failure. You've got communism in the Soviet Union, which is as liberal as a governmental society as you're going to get. But all of these new countries, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Greece, uh, Poland, the, the Baltic states, right? They're all new. So they all have to make new institutions. They all have to figure out what does it mean to be Hungarian? What does it mean to be Yugoslavian? Because... What it meant to be Hungarian in the 19th century is now different. Hungary is like one third the size that it used to be. Romania is far bigger. Bulgaria was smaller, then it got bigger, then it got smaller, right? Greece is, has an ancient tradition, but that ancient tradition also included islands, outposts in the Crimea, outposts in, in Istanbul and the coast of, of Asia Minor um, that the Turks are calling Turkey now? You know, um, what does it mean? What does it mean to be a Yugoslav? There was no Yugoslavs. There's Croatians and Slovenians and Serbians. But what does it mean to be a Yugoslav? What the hell is that? And so you needed all these new institutions and all of that had to change. You didn't have the kings anymore. And where you did have kings, they were weak kings that, that had no real legitimacy. It was a king to have a king. And so in Eastern Europe, it's all change all the time. And it's why those countries were so weak come the 30s when the, when the Great Depression happens. But the UK and France and Italy were more socialist than the United States. There were more widows and orphans and war vets to support. But there's also more of an anti-communist conservatism as well. The USSR supported communist parties in Western Europe, in France, in Italy, in Germany, in a way it never really could in the United States. Like, the Red Scare was like, oh, my God, we might all become communists. And th there wasn't really any. I mean, the Communist Party of the United States is a joke. It just is. The Fascist Party in the United States, the Fascist Parties, they were seriously connected to fascist governments in Europe. And we'll talk about why that was later. But in Europe, in France, in Italy, in Germany, the Communist Parties were well dug in, well connected to the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Especially once Stalin solidifies his control in the late 20s and the early 30s. You know, part of his policy was to support these other communist parties. So you get an anti-communism conservatism as well. And we're going to see how that works in Germany because that's going to give us the fascists. That's going to give us the Nazis. That's going to give us Hitler. Like, Hitler wins an election, but never gains a majority. How does Hitler come to power? It's conservative parties say to the Nazis, we like your energy, we like your style. Why don't we put you in charge, and we'll, lead, we'll really lead from behind you. We'll be the deep state. But, you know, you'll be in charge, quote unquote. But we like your supporters voting. And the one thing we can all agree is that we get to beat up on communists, right? So that's going to be the fascist. That's going to be Mussolini. Mussolini comes to power in the 20s be, by being anti-communist. So so in Europe, you get in the United States, you have anti-communism as part of conservative, but in Europe, it's really part of the identity of conservative parties, where it's a propaganda piece in the United States. It's effective on-the-street policy and law in 
European countries. Italian fascists were violent opposition to communism. They want to return Italy to glory. The French conservatives were anti-communist, anti-worker, and they wanted to keep Germany weak, so a strong foreign policy. The UK conservatives wanted to keep the empire together, rebuild the credit, rebuild the banking, rebuild the financial systems. Britain had been the center of the financial world. By the end of the First World War, that's really New York now. It's really America now. But there's still the chance that Britain might be able to take it back. It still owns something like 25% of the world. So at least be on par with New York, right? London, London is a great city. And the idea was to make Britain Britannia again. Hail Britannia. You know, Britain of 1890. Britain, the Britain of Kipling. You know? So what event terrified conservatism? The Great Depression. Why? Because it was, it was the death of liberal capitalism. Liberal capitalism. Laissez-faire capitalism. The idea that corporations know best how to run themselves died in 1929. It died. Capitalism died. We call our system capitalist. It's not. It's a heavily, heavily regulated redistributive system. It's not Adam Smith's capitalism. It's not Carnegie's capitalism. It's certainly not Alexander Hamilton's capitalism and the capitalism that scared Jefferson. No, 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 no. That idea of capitalism, that Adam Smith wealth of nation capitalism of 1776 dies in 1929, in October of 1929. So with the death of the liberal capitalism comes the death of the old order, which was already shot to pieces by World War I. It was already creaky. The empires, right? The mandates, the, the men in charge. We don't, you know, women don't work. The, we already see that that's breaking down, right? Prohibition? Really? The cities don't listen to prohibition. Oh, they have the speakeasy, which was hidden. No, it freaking wasn't. Everybody knew where it was. That's how come you go there. Oh, you need a password. Well, guess what? Guess who knew the password? Everybody. Because the speakeasy needs to make money too. And so part of it is the air of mystery. The seductiveness of, of lying, of being sly. And then every once in a while, the police would raid a place. They do this to the gay bars in the 50s and the 60s. They do the same thing. 90% of the time, it's fine. Nobody cares. But, you know, every once in a while, you have to do something for the papers to show that you're doing something. But remember the rugged individualism. Remember the idea of masculinity. Remember the idea of the eco uh, uh, economics, that if you want a job, you just go and get a job. Just work hard. Well, how can you say get a job if there are no jobs? How can you rely on yourself when no one can rely on themselves, when no one has savings, when they've lost it all in the banks? How can you be prudent in your financial use if there's no place to save your money, no place to invest? In the Great Depression, the stock market lost 90% of its value. 9,000 banks went under. Where are you putting your money that you're saving? So you're, you're going to be prudent and what, stuff it in your mattress? That's not prudent. That's not helping capitalism. So how can banks and markets work if they collapse? So for conservatives, the, the First World War changed a lot, but they were able to kind of Jenga it back together in the 20s out of that trauma. Like, we'll be safe. We'll go back to the way things were. Don't you worry. But the Great Depression just blew the hell out of it all. It was like a, just a bomb, just go like on uh, Mythbusters. They just blew it up at the end. There is no way you could go back. There is no making America 1886 again. It's done. It is over. The Great Depression blew up, and you had to replace it with new ideologies. People were going to demand help. And either 
a new reformed version of, quote, capitalism could do it. Or communism was there. Or a new conservatism, fascism, could lead. And people are going to be attracted to all three of those. And in fact, the fight between all three of those ideas, the fight with, of that ideo uh, ideology between a, quote, socialist capitalism, a more welfare state capitalism, what I call a redistributive capitalism, a capitalism of regulations and high taxes that that moves money to social services from the rich, from the, from the corporations, from capitalism, from the wealth of capitalism. It moves money to help people. That fight between that group, communism and fascism, is going to kill roughly 100 million people by 1990. Between the Second World War Mao's, China, Stalin's, Soviet Union, America's wars in lots of places, especially Vietnam, um, Soviet Union's war in Afghanistan, all of the Cold War, um, third-party proxy wars that are going to be financed by the United States and the Soviet Union. You're talking roughly 100 million people. So the next couple of chapters are going to be getting ready for that fight, talking about that fight, and the early stages of that fight. And what that conflict did to culture around the world. So thank you, be safe, and take care.